All right, audio is up. Now let's get the let's get the video up. We are recording. And I'm going in here to get this. All right, here we go. Okay, everything is on. We are rocking and rolling right now. Pictures up, audio is up. This is part two, ladies and gentlemen. This is part two of uh, Randy and my discussion about uh, March 31st and the significance of uh, that date, all right? In the story of 10-9. Let's come this way, Randy, toward me. Mm -hmm. All right, there it is. We switched up. We switched up our attire. I'm still wearing my 10-9 uh, T-shirt under here, but now we're rocking the Nipsey uh, Crenshaw jerseys, um, sweatshirts, sweatshirts, mm -hmm. and just for verification, the TMC logo is right here. Boom, mm -hmm. Nipsey. I don't know the exact wording, but Nipsey said if it doesn't have this tag, it's not authentic. So that's just to show our support. You dig? <laughs> All right. Now, with regard to ten nine. I would like to point out uh, my artwork in the back here. All right. Jean-Michel Basquiat. I mentioned this in the previous video. Jean-Michel Basquiat was mentioned by Nipsey Hussle. Nipsey was aware of Jean-Michel Basquiat's legacy, his artwork. And I, too, was aware of um, Jean-Michel Basquiat. But I did not know. I did not know that Jean-Michel Basquiat in one of his works of art, wrote one, zero, and nine. Until it was 11.09 p.m. when I was watching a documentary about Jean-Michel Basquiat. And I saw this work of art. And I'm going to point it out to you right now where it, where it says 109. Wait, can I see it? Can they see it? Yeah. We're filming there, there, and there. Just We've got checking. three cameras going. Right here, you can't see me right here, but over there, you can see me. All right? So I'm going to do that one more time. Boom. For real. Randy, it was 11.09 p.m. 1.109 p.m. I was watching a documentary about Jean-Michel Basquiat and they showed this painting at exactly 11.09 p.m. Wow. So I saw it at 11.09 p.m. I saw 109 on the screen, y'all. Come on, y'all. Come on. That's wild. I didn't plan that. I had no idea what was on that documentary. And those two times matched up. Just like when I was in the desert, that car cut me off, and the license plate was 109, and I happened to be there to see that. I'm just saying, y'all. Coincidences. This, these coincidences. This, this is the crux, or this is the, um, this is the the pulp in my nonfiction. Not pulp fiction. This is pulp nonfiction. This is the stuff that that inspired me to write ten nine. These coincidences, these wild experiences, where I was just like, "This is why is this happening? This is weird." But it was on March thirty first, two thousand and nineteen. Excuse me. It was partly March thirty first. 2019 but it, it was a week after it was a week after about april 7th 2019 when everything came together and it was like this is why you've been seeing all of that stuff like the puzzle pieces were put together everything fell into place i could see it clearly i understood what was happening why it was happening and i was like now I have a story to tell. 
You know what's so weird? I don't, I don't want to say weird, but, like, did you realize, like, after his death, like, or prior to um, his death, like, all the um, pieces, like, putting, like, everything together, like, making it all make sense to come up with your book? Does that make sense? All right, my book is basically, it's a house for my poem. And the poem didn't just, it didn't come to me, I wasn't just writing continuously and then I had it. I didn't just sit down and write it. The poem came to me in verses, or rather in, in stanzas. I was inspired. I could see everything, but I didn't know how to communicate it because... I've tried to write poetry in the past. I've tried to write a rap in the past and I failed. And I'm not I'm not that. I'm not a poet, I'm not a rapper. That's what you told me. We'll get back to that later. <laughs> but somehow everything it was just like it was like you have to tell, you have to put these things, these pieces together. And I started trying. I just tried. I was like, "All right, I'm going to first I'm going to steal DJ Quick's lyrics." Because Quick is is another one of my heroes, and I've been a fan forever. So I, I took a verse from Quick, and I just modified it. And then it fit. I was able to tell my story through Quick's template. I was like, oh, that works. Cool. And then I would think about it and think about it. Well, where do I go next? Like, who do I steal from next? And I didn't know. But then I said, okay, let me try to write something on my own. So I started writing some things, and, and the story started coming out of me. I started putting things together. I did steal from none other than Will Smith, <laughs> Mr. Slappity Slap. <laughs> uh-uh, Will. Um, yeah, so I did steal from the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Now, Randy, check this out. So I borrowed the lyrics from the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air only because... I had an incident in my life that mirrored exactly what was discussed in that rap. Okay. Okay. So Will Smith said, whistled for a cab, and when it came near, the license plate said fresh, and it had dice in the mirror. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so he's basically saying that he's the fresh prince, the dice, no, no, the license plate said fresh. So it was a car meant for him. Mm -hmm. Yo. My numbers are 10 and 9. I pull up to the curb to hail a, a cab, and the license plate on the cab says 10 9. Damn. You're at 109 right now. I'm like, that was Kobe saying you're at 109 right now. In case you're wondering, what was that sound? I'll play it again so you hear it. You're at 109 right now. You're yeah. <laughs> Whistle for a cab, and when it came near, the license plate read, the recent license plate said fresh, and it had dice in the mirrors. In my case, held a cab in Saudi Arabia, held a cab, and when it came near, the license plate read 10 9, and it had me feeling weird. If anything, I could say this cab was rare, but I told myself, have no fear. Because when these instances happen, and you're like, yo, why, why is this happening? It's like, yo, I'm, I'm a little scared, a little nervous, a little paranoid. Yeah, I had a little paranoia going on. Like, somebody's watching me. Somebody's putting this in my path. So I will see it. They want me to see it. They want me to know. We we know where you are, Negro. <laughs> Watch yourself. I'm like, oh my goodness. Yeah, so that's how, I, yeah, I was a little trepid. But I jumped in the taxi anyway, went home, and I was safe, and it was all beautiful. And then that's how I turned that, when I see 10-9, I embrace it. It's like those are my numbers. I'm good with it. That's pretty cool how you, you know, you know, in their like, in their twine, like the um, Fresh Prince of Bel Air, his story with the rap. And then, <sighs> I like that. The, the, and, and the point that I want to stress is I did not plan that rap. You know, I borrowed it. I put it here. I put it there. And when I was writing it, so I put... One part here, one stanza here, and I put another stanza next. But by the time I finished the poem, I had already rearranged each stanza. 
because it wasn't it wasn't clear in my mind when I was writing it, but it all came out. And once it was all on the paper, then I could rearrange rearrange it and edit it and so forth and so on. So that's what's up. That's what happened. Where are we? Where are we gonna go? What are we gonna talk about next? I just wanna quickly uh just you kinda of talked about uh <laughs> you kinda of talked about um like your reaction and what happened when you learned about his death? One oh nine? Yeah, in the first part we talked about I was I felt sad, I felt angry because the guy cut me off. I, a feeling washed over me, I felt calm. Yeah, all of these things happened. Mm-hmm. But I kind of want to briefly talk about, like, my experience. I, I don't have much of an experience. I knew of Nipsey, but I didn't know, like, the details. I didn't know, like, his accomplishments. Um, I just knew that he was a rapper. That was pretty much it. But And you didn't know about Nipsey, but Nipsey's murder, Nipsey, Nipsey's demise impacted you immediately because you were in Los Angeles. And right around the corner, I was... Boom, for real. I was actually in Orange County, if you're familiar with Orange County. and So I, went, I was in Orange County coming home with my mother and my daughter. And I literally lived like a minute away from where he was murdered in his um, shop. So I was driving down Slauson, coming from Orange County, and I see helicopters flying everywhere. And... It, like, okay, they were, like, at a standstill, and then, like, just, like just the street was kind of blocked off, for, like, further down, like, east of Slauson, and I was just like, what's going on? It, it just, something didn't seem right. It was just, like, a very, like, weird day. It was kind of like 9 Yes, it was kind of like, like, 9-11, like, a day yeah. like that. It was just, like, everything just stood still. It was weird. And so I got a call from my brother um, telling me that, you know, you no, know, you heard what happened. Nipsey got murdered. Like, wait, what? What? So I was like, wow. I was just like, I was shocked because, you no, know, it was like right around the corner. And then, you know, I've heard of him. But as I started to learn more about him, I was even more shocked. I learned about him through you. So, like, that's another story. But And see, that's, okay. That's the thing. Nipsey was popular. He was world famous when he passed. But, you know, in Randy's experience, in my experience, Nipsey was, uh, what is it, encroached. He was, uh, what is it, uh, ingrained. Nipsey was ingrained in the culture, especially gang culture in Los Angeles. Randy and I are not. Mm -mm. So for us to know of Nipsey's significance, we would have to be closer to that element than either of us want to be, okay, for for our safety, all right? Um, and so, so Randy didn't know anything about Nipsey. Yeah. Everything I learned about Nipsey, I learned about from watching his uh, development. See, I, I'm, a, I'm a hip-hop, I'm a rap fan, and I would see Nipsey's um, <laughs> videos, um, some friends of mine from elementary school who I'm still f friends with who are in the music industry. I have friends who work with, alongside Snoop Dogg. My cousin worked with Nipsey. Um, and a, my, another friend of mine works, worked directly with Nipsey. These people who I share my childhood with, they would say, hey, Nipsey's a good guy. Check him out. I just want to add something too. So my father, he was well known in the LA area, Los Angeles. Um, supposedly, uh, my dad was a mentor. Like he looked up to my father, but my father had died like years prior, so I wasn't able to learn, you know, about that through him. But yeah, it's you know they kind of like knew of each other and possibly knew each other. So just wanted to add that, but but I still didn't know the history about him until. Like, very kind of helped me. When we, you know, as far as uh, what we know about events, what we know about people, you know, we're learning. And I liken, you know, my, my story in my poem um, to uh, an awakening and a, a journey of mine. 
the more that I learn knowledge of self, the learn the more that I learned of uh, history, especially the history of Ethiopia and Eritrea and of the Bible, then I started to see more than what is on the surface. So we don't always know. We, we aren't always aware of our connections to other people. You know, it, and life is a journey over which we we are, you know, evolving and learning. And I'll say that, you know, in Nipsey's case, it, it, it was mind boggling. It was so interesting because I listened to the interview where Nipsey said that he didn't even know the meaning of his name right. until six or six or seven years before his his passing. You know, he tells the story. He was on the radio um, telling the story about how he was uh, with one of his homegirls and his homegirl asked him what his name meant. Excuse me. Ermius was Nipsey's name. And Nipsey said to his homegirl, I don't even know. She said, no, Nipsey said, I don't even know the name, what my name means. It's just an African name. She said, you sound crazy. African um, names mean something. So they did a quick Google search. They did a quick Google search, and they discovered his name meant God will rise. Wow. Everything that I was learning about Ethiopia, Eritrea, the Bible, Nipsey's name, like everything put together helped me write 10-9. And the conclusion that I was able to draw from all of these tidbits was there was something greatly spiritual, greatly divine about Nipsey that too many of these things just could not be coincidences. Especially the fact that seven days after Nipsey's murder, while I was in the desert, I saw something that I couldn't explain. At that time, I couldn't explain it. Now, I can try to explain it, but I still believe that what I saw was a miracle. I saw two lines in the sky intersecting to form a cross. Now, they look like they could have been made by airplanes, but trip this, go on flight tracker 24-7 or something, and when you can look at the planes that are flying overhead, and you can get an idea how many fl planes fly over a particular space, at any given time, using an app, I think it's called Flight Tracker 24-7, the area where I was, airplanes don't even fly over that area. Wow. So how do I explain two lines that look like they could have been made by airplanes, but they couldn't have been made by airplanes because airplanes don't fly overhead. So, I don't know. And they were intersecting, I'm sorry, they're intersecting each other, right? Intersecting. Yeah, maybe you can call it a plus sign. Maybe you can call it an X. I looked up, I saw a cross. And I was like, dang, Nipsey's gone. A cross in the sky. Nipsey's name, God will rise. Nipsey was from Eritrea. The country of Eritrea and Ethiopia once were combined, were together, and they formed, they were part of the Aksumite Empire. A lot of information, a lot of things that I didn't know before that I, I, I came to learn. And then I was like, Nipsey just Nipsey wasn't just some rolling 60s who had a good rap career. No. This, this brother was something much greater. So your book kind of explains a little bit of that and your journeys, a little bit of everything. Yeah, it, it talks about my interpretation of who Nipsey was. I'm, we met uh, a young guy, 20 years old, uh, Darius. We met him in um, Lamert Park today. And I told Darius, hey man, I think Nipsey, I said this to him, I said, I think Nipsey was the closest that we have come to seeing Jesus in our lifetime. 20 year old man. And he didn't think I was crazy when I said this. He said, yeah. Yeah. And I was like, wait, wait, wait. 
you, you agree with me? He was like, yeah, man. Like, Nipsey was divine. Nipsey incorporated. I mean, he, he was clear. He said Nipsey was not Jesus. But he said, but Nipsey incorporated all of those elements that are familiar to us through the life of Jesus. And I was like, yo. That's what I'm saying. That's what that's the conclusion I came to through all of this stuff. So it's quite interesting. It's quite interesting. So what did you do earlier today? Oh yeah. That's what's up. <laughs> all right. We're running out of time. I have to quickly say this. I don't want to All right. So I'm feeling all sorts of ways because when Nipsey was murdered, I was in the desert. But now I'm back in L.A. So I'm driving down Crenshaw this morning intentionally. OK, this is not some coincidence I'm talking about. I was going down because I'm thinking, yo, March 31st is the day we lost Nipsey. So I, I make my way to Crenshaw and Slauson. And then I notice it's clear. No one's there. It's and always crowded. It's always crowded, okay? Now, here's the thing. It was about 10.09 a.m. Uh, really, Larry? <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. All right, all right, all right. Just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> Let me calm down. Let me calm It wasn't. It was probably like a, around 11 in the morning, right? It was like 10 going on 11. But the streets, I mean, there people were out on the streets, but in front of Nipsey's um, store and in that parking lot, it was empty. There were no vendors out there at that hour. There were no tourists. Completely empty. Wow, that's a first. So I pull up. I park my car. I I'd hop out and I start filming that area. And I felt like I had a, a connection. I felt like it was I'm like I was meant to be there. Because I had, you know what, when Nipsey was murdered and when I was in Oman in the desert, I was like, this is such... He was such a great spirit. There, there needs to be something. I, I want to do something there at the TMC. And I thought maybe if I had a bottle of Ethiopian water, you know, I could pour it out. And that would be to show the connection between, you know, his country or rather um, that Aksumite empire. Not the country because th those politics are different today. Um yeah, but I wanted to show the connection between a biblical um, empire and Nipsey and Nipsey's life. So I wanted to pour some some water from Ethiopia there as a spiritual sort of um, event. I wanted to do something. Um, and then here we are three years later where I actually had an opportunity to do something to sort of uh, what pay respects to go to that site. And it was completely empty. I had the site to myself. That's what I'm saying. We had peace with him. Peace at peace, and I mean it's still a hot, dangerous spot because people, some a tourist got shot over there. So I was like, I'm gonna be in here for a minute, and I'm gonna <laughs> get on out. Okay, <laughs> but nah, it's all good. All right, the the camera's probably gonna start overheating in a minute, so we have to wrap this up. Did we get everything out that we needed to talk about in the second part? I think so. Cool. Thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for sharing your story. All right. And we're rocking our Nipsey sweatshirts, y'all. All right, we're going to cut it off here. This is part two of um, the 10-9 um, like discussion about the date that Nip died, March 31st, 2019. This is the three year, third year anniversary. It's also going to be the third year anniversary of, <laughs> anniversary of something else. Never mind. Yeah, we might as well mention that. Our third year uh, anniversary is coming up. Mm -hmm. And. Put that on your calendar. Put that on the calendar. I cannot forget. I, I will not forget our, uh, our anniversary because there was a car in Oman with a license plate that said 109. And it was 10914. Before we even... Before we even, like, planned to get married. We just picked a random date, too. Picked a random date. It just worked out. And the the, the anniversary date was 914. And I noticed the picture. I, you showed the picture. I said, wait, Larry, look at the numbers. 
I took the picture not knowing what I was taking a picture of, and that picture foretold the date that we would get married. Wow. All I thought I was looking at was 10 and 9. I'm like, look at that, Randy, 109. She was like, "Uh uh-uh, keep keep reading. I was like, what? 10914. She was like, doesn't that date, doesn't that number ring a bell? I'm like, no, not really. (laughs) Boom, 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 boom. Look closer, (laughs) boom. Like, what? It's anniversary. It's our anniversary. All right, y'all, peace. All right, so let me stop the. Rolling 60s, nigga. Neighborhood. That's what it is. I'm good. I appreciate it, though.